sorry. I would like to introduce now Lionel Moiseau from L Acoustics. Lionel. <laughs> As um, Josh told you, I work for L Acoustics. So, um, I'm, I am very sad today because I am not speaking on an L Acoustics speaker because that's our business. It, it's not the worst thing, Electro Voice is a uh, fair competitor, but I would like to use my own speakers. Yeah. <laughs> so today I'm going to talk to you about how we publish documentation in my team and in my company. Um, and I think it can be interesting for small teams and maybe for bigger teams. I just don't have any experience with bigger teams. So. First, our company. So we are a leader in Perfino Audio uh, solution. We provide speakers, amplifiers, um, software to control everything and um, plan everything for a huge. Um, like we we equip the Hollywood Bowl. We've been equipping it for 20 years. So when you see the speakers on the side, you can think about L acoustic. We did the Lord Melodra Melodrama Tour, her last tour with a new technology that is really cool. And uh, we also do pre prestige installation like the Paris Fashion Week. We install speakers in the Louvre, so that's nice. On to the team. So we are a small team. There are five tech writers, among which we have two apprentices in the sandwich course, so they do two, two weeks. Um, and one information architect slash toolsmith, that would be me. Um, I'm a, still a little bit of a tech writer, though I tend not to write as much as I used to. And we produce documentation uh, under the, with um, PDFs, so we do user manuals, maintenance manuals, but also marketing documents, because we found a way to replace the graphic designer for some kind, some kind of documents that are very easy to um, lay out. So instead of bothering graphic designers, we actually just use the toolkit. And everybody is very happy about the decision. And we do HTML files for embedded help. So it's not HTML files that goes on the internet. It's HTML files that goes on the hard drive, and it's packaged with the software. So it's a bit of a, a stretch. We would like to find another solution, because doing HTML5 locally with JavaScript is not great. But for now, that's what we do. I have not included it in this slide, but we also use a web platform, web platform which is a street topics. I don't know if anybody from street topics is here, but so we push content, data content to this platform, and the transform is performed by the platform. Um, it's also it's not public yet, so it's not on. The so I'm going to talk to you about an approach that a lot of people describe as dot as code. So most of the time, the test codes, test codes are um, uh, attached to a solution like Markdown or ASCII docs, and uh, it's like a, a low-tech approach or high-tech, depends how you look at it, the documentation. <coughs> Basically, it's using the tools from the software team to do the documentation. And initially, it was thought that you would maintain the documentation in the same repositories as the software. For example, for us, it's not the case. We're just starting doing documentation for software this way. Uh, initially, it was just because we did not have a tool. I did, want, I did not want to buy any CCMS. I did not want to get tied up in a structure. So we started developing our own tools, first without any Git or anything, just the server. And then uh, building on this, we added Git and other tools. So one great thing with this approach is you learn about the software team tools. And uh, the better you get at uh, software tools, the better your relationship with the software teams gets. Because they get uh, that you understand how they work. You use the same build as them. And sometimes you get even better than them in some of their tools. So now, for example, uh, when they need information about uh, GitLab CI, the continuous integration of GitLab, we are the reference, because they are not on it yet, but we started before them. So we get some street cred out of the approach. Oh, no? It's not too long. Yes. So these are the main tools we use. So please raise your hands if you know the tool. So Git. Yes. 
grade of okay artifactory okay. and the GitLab runner. Okay. So sorry for people who did not really raise their hand. I will try and explain a little bit, but I will not go into depth. So Git, as most of you know, is a decentralized version control system, which means that everybody can actually be the server instead of um, all control systems where there was one server and everybody had to make copies. So it's nice for us because it it helps us working in par uh, work in parallel on the same file. We don't need a check out checking system, and also it's nice because we can work offline. We just copy the file at some point, do a branch, and then be merged back later. So it has been a great help for our solution to be able to work in this. Also, it's pretty simple. You don't go into too much complications. So everybody can use Git. So it is so widely used that actually GitHub is uh, managed with uh, Git, as are a lot of uh, modern tools. And this is where we put all our authored files. So if we edit a file, if someone creates an editor file, it goes in Git. It's important for the, the next step. And also, we have a very modular approach, which means that every product or system has its own repository, which means that someone coming in the team and working on one project just has to clone one project. They have access to the whole documentation structure. So when I have a junior tech writer coming in, I give him a project, and it only has like five maps and uh, 300 topics and images to handle, instead of having a whole database of content he does not know what to do with. Um, on to Artifactory. So, Artifactory is a package, oh, yeah, feedback, okay, is a package repository manager, which means that you can put zips or jar files or any file on it, and then you can tag them with a group, a name, and a version, and then with an appropriate system, like Gradle, you can get back the right version of the of what you want. It also has support for dependency management, which means that if you put a package online, and this package needs another package, when you get the first one, you'll get the second one, and even the third one, and you can chain dependencies, which is very important with our system. And so that's where we store everything that's um, generated. So we generate from a lot of sources. These files are not to be edited, they're just there for a uh, convert resolution, just like that, so that's why we put this file. Next, Gradle. So, Gradle is how the toolkit is built today. If you want to download or clone the um, uh, GitHub um, repository, then you have to launch a Gradle command to build the actual toolkit. Um, so, it, um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but basically it's like ant, but more modern. It's um, it's a good ant. <laughs> so that's mainly why I chose this solution because it was easier to get into than ant, and it had a better documentation. I think it's based on Groovy, which is a language that is based on Java, so you can get a lot of things from Java and more things from Groovy, and it is as ant task oriented. So. You define a task, you drop some, something, then you get an output and you can do task and chain task and even end handle dependencies uh, between tasks, like two pipelines. So it's a pretty um, interesting system. It's used by a lot of big companies like Facebook, Netflix, so there's a lot of support. And it's free also. <laughs> and then there are two uh, plugins that are very useful for us, developed by Eero Elenius. I think that's how you say it. Uh, so it's the GitHub and the Saxon plugins. So you can actually launch the GitHub from Gradle with a plugin that affords you a lot of um, different uh, um, possibilities that are, are not possible with the, just the GitHub. And I think that's how the core team of GitHub builds the documentation <coughs> with the Gradle plugin. Um. <laughs> Let's see. Lastly, the GitLab continuous integration solution is um, an automation solution integrated with Git. So it's nice because you have all the concepts from Git, branches, tags, stuff like that. Um, it does the same thing as a person. It's just um, you say, do this command line, do this action, get the file from there, 
any frog, so which, which is great because this way I can test locally and I have a good impression of what's going to work and not work online. Also, I can do a lot of uh, DevOps stuff, like inject uh, parameters, get context from the build. So, it's an interesting tool. And also, there's a web platform. So, if I want a user to launch a publication, I can tell him, go there and launch a pipeline, select your branch, and it will do the work. So, I don't need to, to actually build from the start a dashboard with actions for my users. They can actually go into GitLab. It's a little bit um, technical, but my uh, audience is pretty technical. They know Git, so it's easy for them. Oh. So, quickly. <laughs> One thing, uh, two, two important things. So, we use submodules. So, who knows some submodules? Okay, <laughs> so basically a submodule is a repo in a repo. So, a repo is a repository of folder, Git folder, and you can put inside the super project, small project. So it's an indirect direction uh, level. So what we do is that we put all the publish publication maps in the super project because they are specific to a system. One important thing is that um, we only publish one document from one map. We don't have a document that is published both to PDF and HTML5, for example. We have made this choice. Maybe it's not the best choice, but it's easier for authors to say, I'm opening this document and this, this document. Uh, and also, we put the build files, so everything that launches the, the project. And then, all the topics and resources are in submodules, which is important because you may want to use the files from one system over there in another system. So, it's modular, we can do whatever we want with it. A lot of people criticize submodules because they add complexity to uh, Git. Lucky for us, we are a documentation team, so we have documented our process. <laughs> and it's pretty easy when you just follow instructions. We could even do scripts to automate a lot of stuff, but for now, we, we did not have huge problems that we could not solve. Lastly, as I said, generated resources are handled as artifacts. So, basically, they are downloaded uh, in the folder when you work and at real time. They are also downloaded in the position they should be. So, if you need images, you need to download the image uh, folder at the right spot. So, one thing that's cool with Artifact is that you can actually uh, discretize between uh, different um, environments. So, we have a release uh, repository that is only for releases where the versions are specific. For example, if you do the June 2000 uh, 18 uh, documentation for a software, you can actually tag it this way. Then we have a snapshot. So the snapshot will just replace the same archive every day, every time you build. And then a test environment, which is great for plugging. So thanks to this system, I think I've automated a third of my documentation that is directly pulled from other sources. And all this mainly is done through the Saxon Gradle plugin, because you can do a lot of stuff with it. So, <laughs> I think that's very important to understand is that um, we have a lot of plugins. I think I have more plugins than uh, Robert, and he's working for IPM. <laughs> so basically, I followed a recommendation from Robert, is that instead of creating parameters all over the place, when you have a new parameter, create a new trend type. So every single document type has its own trend type, which seems crazy, but it's very easy for authors to understand. I am writing a user manual. This is a user manual. The plugin is called user manual, so no question here. And each big feature block also has a plugin. So for example, we have, I don't know, we integrated Bootstrap and Video.js in our HTML5 help. So we have two plugins, one bootstrap, one uh, video JS, stuff like that. So we don't have huge plugins with a lot of features. We discretize everything. Question, how do we deal? Because this is really hard. Uh, I, I mean, 64 plugins, how do authors deal? They deal through dependency management. So <coughs> I'm stepping on a... Uh, Yarnos <coughs> ground <laughs> right now, but so I've implemented in my build uh, plugin dependency management and automatic install in the data open toolkit. For example, this is the user guide 
the dependencies of the user guide plugin. So when someone wants to publish the user, user guide, just declare it's a help user guide. And then they get the help plugin, which comes with the base plugin, another HTML thing, boilerplate, strings, something from Oxygen to embed HTML in HTML in uh, data. And more, uh, more Oxygen stuff, like the media plugin that copies all the MP4 um, files. So declare one plugin, get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten plugins. How do I create this dependency? I use the plugin file. So the plugin file, you have an element called require that makes your build fail if you forget to put the plugin in. Um, so what I do is I, I declare a dependency to another plugin, and I declare the version of this target plugin. When I don't want to declare a version, I take advantage of the feature of Gradle which is you can get the latest version of the plugin is the plus sign. So for example, Oxygen XML Media, um, I'm not maintaining this plugin. If there are evolution of the plugins and I integrate them in my system, um, they will be uh, well done. So I just want the latest version. But for the help, I want a specific version. And this is important for the, for the next step. So I take this, I put it in the second Gradle task. Um, I generate a lot of files with it, uh, dependency files, and then I upload everything to Artifactory where the, the dependencies are declared. And at build time, the plugin dependencies are resolved. They are copied in the Zeta OT plugins folder, and then they are installed with the Zeta comment. And this way, my Zeta OT instance is ready to transform what I want to transform. It's also great for uh, development or bug fixing. So for example, if someone tells me, uh, I need a margin there in this kind of uh, table, I can go in Git, in my Git repository for plugins, do a branch, change version numbers, change the version numbers that were uh, referenced in the um, require elements, and then I have a whole parallel uh, way of defining plugins, and when the person that raised the issue wants to test it, they just have to select the right branch in the build repo, and they can just test it in a control environment without um, creating problems for other uh, authors, and when it's good, we merge everything in Git, and on we go with the new version. That really made our, my life as a business leader easier, and it's made it easier to pass on this task to someone more junior in my team, because I'm not afraid she will make mistakes because she's really in her own world. And this is something that I think has really improved our uh, plugin development. Uh, so on to the build. So as I said earlier, it's based on the digital Gradle plugin. Um, so one great thing about this plugin is it takes a list of files as an input. So it's called file tree in Gradle. And um, so instead of de declaring five, six, seven transforms, I just declare one, and all these files are transformed. One thing that you can also do is declare several trans types. So that, that I don't do because my files, I, as you remember, my data maps are for like, one document. But I could declare like three different transforms for the same map, and then I would get um, all the different versions in the end. So this is great. Um, also, it has a way of picking up files that have the same name. So for example, if I have a property file that has the same name as the map, it will be picked up automatically, which is great. This way I don't have to declare more stuff. And also for DataVal. So my DataVal has the same name as the map. It's picked up automatically. And also the developer is great. Yodo Elenius is a nice guy all around, and it's also really easy to work with. It's a very small project for him. I don't think uh, he has a lot of users that are active on GitHub, so when you ask for something, you can chat with him, and uh, he has the time. Well, when he has the time, he takes the time to do what you need. And also has great inputs on how to implement his plugin. So 
Gradle naturally uh, handles all dependencies, as I said. One big dependency for me is the actual Gita Open Toolkit. So I put the Open Toolkit zip on Arch Factory, and it's downloaded every time I do this. It's quicker than downloading the topic from the website, I guess. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so, um, plugins I've talked about and gener generated content is the artifact that they put automatically online. And I think I'm running out of time. So, let's go a little bit faster. So, first, um, there are two files to declare all these things. The first file is this one. So, this is a Gradle uh, file that is outside of the build and it's edited by the author or by the information architect, depending on the content. So here you have a list of input. I could have used um, wildcard. You can use wildcard to say I want all the files that end with the uh, data map string. So it's nice because you can pick your naming convention. You can select what you want with this kind of wildcard. Then as a content dependency. So here you see I'm in a dev environment, I use the snapshot, and I even have an external plugin to add Jetpack capability to my bit of toolkit. So it's a joke plugin. But uh, basically what I did is declare GitHub as a repository, an ID re re repository, and then I can select plugins from GitHub, declaring them as artifacts. And this plugin will, will be installed in my Dittority instance during my build. So I don't really need to put them in an actual repository as long as they are declared in um, GitHub. It's better if they have a release, otherwise you just get the master, the head uh, version. But if people do release it, you can actually do the release of the tag details. Okay. And then the second configuration file is the actual data map of the publication. So I don't want my authors going out of their environment. I just want them to use whatever is in their world. And what they do all the time is work with data map. So I have to put some stuff in a Gradle file. I could put everything in the data map. I'm just lazy and it works this way, so <laughs> I don't want to do it. But here, you will see that I declare two things. First, the trend type, the help user guide. So this is the document type. And then I declare actual parameters. So I have blurred uh, uh, product name, but I choose the logo, so it's just the name of the file without the extension. This file is stored in uh, uh, the plugins called uh, Boilerplate. And then I have the group type because this is a, a bootstrap output. So in bootstrap, you know you have columns. So this defines that there are three columns on the first page. I could put two, six, twelve. And this is for the author to choose, because uh, uh, they are the, the best uh, people to know what they want in the end, since they are working with the files all the time. Not all parameters are available this way, but most of them are. It's also very uh, good when we don't have time to implement a new trend type. You can just put some processing and then use a parameter. And when we have time to create the trend type plugin, we just have to take it out, put it in the trend type plugin. So it's a, a way of working a little bit faster. Oh. So for the actual build, um, so this is only available to technical writers, the local build, because they do it all the time. I don't want my contributors that do it twice a month to mess with local build, because otherwise they get lost and okay, they get lost. Uh, so basically what they clone the build which repository, it's it has a great Gradle wrapper in it, which means that they don't have to install anything because the first time they run the script, Gradle downloads itself. They just need Java installed in the machine. But if you do work with Oxygen and with the DTOT, I think you have Java in your machine. So, it, so Gradle can download itself with the right version. And then you have all the available trend types listed in the build. So this is just a small amount of the trend types. And here you see that I've defined exactly which version should be in production. Okay. So they just go to their console and type radio build all and all is built locally and you get the results on the hard drive. Well, this is simple. 
for contributors, uh, it's a little bit more developed. So contributors use XML web authors, which is a great tool. Buy it, it's really good. <laughs> Uh, changes are pushed to the server by web authors. It's great because this way I don't have to explain Git to them. Because sometimes Git can be a bit challenging. Then the branch is pushed up by the GitLab runner. Uh, so if they push push to some branch, it will be automatic. Sometimes they have to go there and push a button. Still, okay. And then the Gradle script is executed. So this is the Gradle script. I'm not going to go into too much detail because I already explained a lot of um, steps. Um, what I've not put in it is that I have a, another branch, another pipe in my plugin, in my build to push stuff to um, topic that uses the data export plugin. Also, what I can do is export the sources. So I use the data normalized plugin to push the sources as an artifact for releases. This way, when I want to send them in translation, just have to download this artifact, it's sent it to my uh, translation provider. And it, since it does not have converts or anything, it's easier for the translator to translate because it does not have the variable file. Um, and then what's very important is, is that everything is published to Artifactory. So when the software team needs the documentation of our software, they don't have to ask us. They know that the version is on Artifactory and they have integrated this step in their build. So this is great for everybody. And um, so this process with the um, web author thing has been adopted by, I think, uh, at least six contributors. Among them, I have two uh, directors, a director of R&D in a, another enterprise in my group, and another di director that writes a lot of scientific content. And they are very happy with the whole thing because they actually just have to write content, and at some point it will magically appear somewhere. So I have removed the idea of a build from their point of view. And I think that's the main thing with this system. Hide the complexity. So why does it work to speak like Yarno a little bit? So one thing that will make time to develop our tool. I know that not everybody has time, what I've sold to my management is that if they let me develop tools down the line, I will be able to answer uh, their, uh, their desires. Like, oh, now I want a new kind of publication that does this, 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 this. If I have to implement it in a rigid uh, tool that I've built, it's a bit more complicated than if I can build it myself. So that's why I say it's for either small teams with uh, Understanding management or very big team with someone that is dedicated to it. So it's not for everybody. So as I said, we work with the software team, which is very important. It's not enough for me. Uh, data was already adopted as the reference con uh, format for documentation and even some non-documentation content, which is a big plus. I didn't have to do data evangelization in my company along with the build. We develop our tools. IT, the IT team has no uh, control over our tools. They just provide infrastructure. Mostly because they don't have time to do it, but this way we are free. <laughs> we don't have to answer to anybody. Just it must work when release comes. That's the only thing. And also, since we are a documentation team, we document everything. And I think it's a big part of this kind of system. When you build it, you have to explain how it works and how it was built. It helps to be able to actually write documentation for this kind of thing. So really quick, what is the missing? Um, so as more people come into the, the system, we need a more comprehensive dashboard. So hopefully we use tools with a lot of API. So GitLab has a pretty comprehensive API. So we could easily build at first an informative dashboard saying, this is being published, this is published, this is there, stuff like that. And then we want to implement actions, like I want to publish this branch, this document, stuff like that. So since GitLab CI has an API to do this, we will try and do it. But for now, it's all in the GitLab CI interface. So one thing we don't have in XML database, 
So it's, it's hard for us to do queries efficiently. We have to use the XFAS uh, editor in Oxygen, and it can take a lot of time when we have a lot of size. For now, it's okay for us because everybody knows the content really well, and we use a lot of keys. We don't have like direct uh, linking, so we can maintain a centralized uh, information on every link and resources. But at some point, we will need to implement some kind of solution. Maybe the data for small team uh, solution could be a good fit. Just take some time, <laughs> but we will do it at some point. Maybe we will hire uh, Elliot to do it. I don't know. And and uh, unit test because I am not a developer and I actually didn't know about unit test when I started doing all this. So sometimes it breaks and I don't know why, so I need to implement a little bit more. Unit testing is not an outside. Um, so this one is a tough one, and another indirection level in data or data open toolkit. What I mean by it is that using tools like Gradle that use the fast pass a lot. Like a lot of stuff is cached and I don't need to say where it is. Um, I would like to be able to do this for all my resource files. Something like a catalog or something like that. I don't really know exactly how to do it, but uh, I think that would be a, a great thing. So that's something. Do you want to do something, Todd? No. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> so what I would like to do is not to have to add anything to my data map to the file in order to benefit from resources. Because right now what I can do is uh, process the data map and add a reference to a map, for example. But for me, it's not satisfactory. I would like to be able to define resources in the environment, something I can't do now. And lastly, what I really want is uh, for Christmas is a bare data distribution build. So I just want the all database plugin, and then I can tell which plugin I need. But for now, it's not, um, it's not uh, ready, I think. Maybe Jano will say something about this in his session. And that's it. Thank you. So, one or two questions, maybe, before. Yes, Elliot. <laughs> <laughs> I was curious if you had uh, given thought to using Maven where you're currently using Gradle, just yeah. I, because yeah. I've seen both. Yeah, so we have a, a test testing team, and they use Maven, and it's a good fit for them because it's very, um, they exactly know what they want to do before. Gradle is a little bit more forgiving. so. It was easier for me to use a language that is really scripting, where I can hack stuff and add stuff along the way. Maven is a syntax that is very strict. Gradle is a little bit more friendly, so. And also, it's a brand new thing, shiny new thing. So <laughs> I can't say I'm not. Thank you, Lionel. So we have now the coffee break, which will be outside, but also across the elevators. So there are two places, uh, not only this one. Um, and we'll be back uh, at 11, <laughs> around. <laughs> I, I will make some noise on uh, to get you in. Okay. But thanks again. And actually, um, you touch on, on some of the points that we discussed about uh, uh, defining a data project and uh, with, you know, like different transformations that the maps that you want to process, the data val files and so on. So that was quite interesting. And also uh, using data with um, uh, Doxa's code ideas is also something that I proposed to a conference to show them you. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so it was quite interesting. Thank you. Thank you.